Right now, the British Boxing Board of Control has announced it is cancelling all tournaments under its jurisdiction. Uh, that decision... And action. <laughs> Welcome to um, uh, Fight and Talk Wales lockdown edition. Um, I've been nagging John now for a while. To what what episode with. is this? Well, this, I, I think we call this Series 2 lockdown. Series 2. So how many episodes did we do in the first one then? I don't know, must have about 10 to 11, something like that. I can't. 12. 12, is it? All oh, right, okay. Well, this is Fight and Talk Wales, Lockdown Edition, Episode 1. Hopefully, there won't be too many of these episodes, because hopefully we won't be locked down for too long. Although, um, well, no, nobody really knows how long we're going to be locked down for. Um, how, how has the, the lockdown affected you, John, and, and your gym? Obviously, I guess most people know that you run Caffili Amateur Boxing Club. Quite, quite a new gym, but really successful. I mean, you've got you know, a massive part of the community in Caffili now. Yeah, well, obviously, um, when this first came about, <clears throat> I didn't take it that serious, I'll be honest. Um, uh, lots of things had stopped happening. Other clubs had stopped, uh, closed down before me. But in my head, I was thinking, if this is as serious as the government are saying, then the first thing they're going to be doing is uh, closing the schools down. And then as soon as they announced they're closing the schools down, I thought, right, we obviously start, need to take this serious now and then. That's when uh, I announced that we were closing the club. Yeah, I mean, uh, it must have been very tough for, for, for the boxers. Um, uh, like boxing, I suppose, is very much about repetition and discipline. So, so after being, I guess, disciplining your fighters to come to the gym on a regular basis, must have been difficult for them to be told not, not to come to the gym at all. Yeah, well, they would get it. And obviously... Um, <clears throat> At the time, there wasn't any uh, rule in that you had to close the gym down. But I took it upon myself probably about uh, a week before they actually came down. And uh, they was all nagging me, come on, come on, open the gym. And uh, I just thought, no, we got to take this serious now. Once the, the kids was out of school, they thought, you know, shit's about to get a real kind of thing. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, it's like with the boxers, um, they, are, they are all struggling. Um, when you do a lot of training, you don't realise it, but it takes a lot of your anxiety away. And then <clears throat> once you've been out to the gym for a week, things start creeping up on you. Then you realise, then, well, it's because I haven't had my workout. Yeah, and, and I suppose as well for yourself, um, you're in the gym, I'm guessing, five nights a week, maybe yeah. maybe more. So yeah, I, I guess that, that's a massive void in your life as well, I guess. It is, yeah. It took, uh, I'll be honest, it took a while to uh, to get used to it. Um, it's weird because come four o'clock, uh, when when tipping point is starting, my, <laughs> my programs, <laughs> I, I, I've got to go up the gym. But it's been great because I've been at the worst tipping point. But no, it, it has been hard to adjust. Um, I, the first week was like, wow, I just don't know what to do with myself. But um, yeah, just been keeping busy. Yeah, and uh, how, how is uh, your assistant coach, Michael? Michael, um, I haven't spoke to him directly. You know, we got a Caffili Boxing Club group chat. Um, we're always talking in there, and probably for the first time, is good, serious advice from me. <laughs> Whereas normally it's, it's banter and abuse in there. But um, <laughs> no, we, we, we talk all the time in chat. I was talking to him last night, um, asking him how he's coping and stuff. Um, so yeah, he's fine. He, he'll do alright. And of course, this time of year in much boxing, amateur boxing, um, most of the boxers, if not all the boxers, are getting ready for the championships. Whether it be schoolboy, novice, senior, um, I mean, they, they probably should be taking place around about now. I think if I'm right in saying that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, that that's obviously. I mean, what have the Welsh ABA said in regards to the championship? Have they been? postponed or, or, or the 2020 championships just being called off do you know um from the last email i read them um, they were still open to give everybody a chance to win this welsh title in 2020 so you know there's hope that it's still going to go ahead this year but um i don't know it's just 
I don't want to be uh, negative, but it's not looking like Leeds fit to me. No, I mean, I, I think personally, it's only my own um, opinion. I'm not based on anything any, anything other than what I see on the news myself. I, I can't see there being any sport, really, whether it be boxing, football, rugby, before much before September, to be honest. Well, you know, the kids', kids uh, school is out until September. My daughter, you know, I'll get this from my daughter, who was here last. <clears throat> a couple of weeks in school, uh, she hadn't even done her exams, and, uh, you know, she'd worked really hard. And now they're going to have the uh, predictive results, which will be good results. And um, but you know, even even she said, you know, I, I don't feel like I've I've earned them. Yeah. So you know, I get that they've taken that away from the kids. They didn't have the chance to have their prom and have their last day in school properly with everybody there. Yeah, it's sad. Yeah, it's getting get for everyone really. And um, yeah, of course, like boxing, it, sort of uh, a lot of boxers, pro fighters. We've been training really hard. Just apologise, that's my phone going in the background there. Give me two seconds, I'll answer it now. You are on. Could be an emergency call, you've got to go and dump the fire on the monk then. No, I hope not. Mrs. answered. Um, it was an emergency call, you won't dump the fire on the monk then, was it? No, 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 no nonsense. <laughs> um, yeah, just, just saying there, like, for, for a lot of professional boxers, what fights coming up, especially the guys. I mean, if, if you're like Anthony Joshua and you're in millions, then it's just an inconvenience. But if you're a, a small hall boxer, if you like, maybe you're in a grand a fight every few months, then yeah. then that, that the money is, is a big, you know, is a, it's a big loss, really. Uh, yeah, massive loss. And, uh, you know, you had the likes of Gavin Gwynn and <coughs> Sullivan so now on that big show in Cardiff. Uh, I don't know exactly what's happening with that now. But uh, yeah, you know, all the hard work and prep they've put into it, and it's all taken away. Yeah, I think they, well, they, they have said that the, the 9th of May show has been pushed back now to June, I think. But I, I can't see it taking place in June, to be honest. With you. Like I said earlier, I can't see any real professional sport taking place much before September. No, no. And, and of course, um, Garen Goodrich is meant to be fighting Morgan Jones for the Welsh middleweight title in, um, in 28th of March. Yeah. Swansea. Obviously, that was, that was been. I mean, Gary now. I think is, I think he's been scheduled to fight for the Welsh title about three times, and every time, uh, the guy he's meant to be fighting, he gets injured, or in this case, the whole show gets binned because of a, a worldwide pandemic. So he's very unlucky in that case. Because I mean, most of these boxers, they don't earn much money. Even even the pros, do they really? I mean, we know probably yeah. much roughly how much they earn, but compared to the dedication they put into it. Well, I like I say, all that hard work and dedication. <laughs> that photo you showed me of Morgan Jones, you know, absolutely stripped. You can see all the hard work he's put into everything, and uh, you know, it was, it was so close to fight week. And uh, well, I don't know if that'll happen again now, do we really? Um, well, I think I think Sanigas are hoping to put it back on. Um, I, I think S4C were hoping to or are hoping to put boxing on at the end of the year, so that they that that fight might fall under. Might actually become on, on the S4C show. Which yeah. Be good for both boxers, good publicity. And um, hopefully that was uh, <coughs> set to be a good fight, that was. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I remember talking, I was probably talking to you about it a few years ago for Morgan Jones moving up to light heavyweight or considering moving up to light heavyweight. Yeah. And I, I couldn't believe it when, well, it was announced that he's actually moving down to middleweight. Yeah. And like yeah, you said, he, he did look, he, well, he does look in absolutely cracking shape, so, so ripped. And he, yeah. he looked in brilliant shape. Uh, that was like two or three weeks before the contest, so really dedicated himself for this fight. I don't know what uh, they do to get these boys down to the weight up in that club in Mountain Ash. You know, fair play to pair those up there, but um, you know, you see Tony Dixon walking around probably, I don't know, 12 stone. Yeah. And then, you think he's never going to make that weight again and come come fight like ripped and shredded and uh, fair play they uh, <coughs> know to get the weight off the boys up there yeah just you mentioned but, but, that sorry oh, you mentioned um, Tony Dixon there did, did you see his fight in Italy his last contest I didn't see it no no he means bloody hell controversy isn't he? yeah, yeah I mean I, 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 I was sort of I was watching on my phone so I, I didn't have a brilliant my dad didn't like watching boxing live boxing on my phone really but um, 
from watching on my phone, I mean, I, I thought he, he won, but obviously boxing in Italy, more or less got to knock them out to be got, try and get a result. But um, yeah, yeah, I mean, brilliant performance by Tony. He just seems to be improving all the time. He is improving, but um, what's, what I think is now is the um, the, mom- the momentum has slowed down, haven't it? I think that's a really important thing to you know, just keep that ball rolling and be out there and active as possible. Yeah. But just I think, the activity is slowed down, anyway, especially in Welsh boxing altogether at the moment. I think Tony had a, a fight lined up, though, didn't he? he um, I think he, he had an, an eliminator for the British title, I think. I could be wrong on that, but I think he, he, had, he had a fight scheduled, didn't he? Oh, against, yeah. a, against a good opponent. Yeah, I didn't see that. Yeah. Um, well, uh, as I said, do you want to contact you about doing this, John? Just to kill a bit of time and keep our three or four fans entertained? Our regular, well, Richard watches, doesn't he? Listens. I'm wondering who's actually going to watch this because <laughs> I've, got, I've, got, I've got very high standards there, okay? <laughs> and, uh, sometimes, uh, I'm not disrespecting anybody, but some of these interviews I'm seeing out there lately, yeah, all right, just giving the boxers some publicity. But it reminds me of me when I started out, and I'm no different now. Still, te- They were terrible. I oh, struggled I- with- I struggle to watch over 10 seconds. I, I'm wondering who's going to watch this. I think you've been, you've been, you've been too hard on yourself for the other day with, with regard to the, the, your interviews, isn't it? You used to love watching interviews. Well, you, you said you didn't used to watch them. You used to listen to them while he was wash, washing the dishes. Yeah, well, I, I used to say, when I knew when he was done it oh. through, I'd save them up. And when I was cooking or doing something in the kitchen, I'd just have them on, on, in the background listening to them. Yeah. The one I, that, um, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I had it all scripted on the phone. I'd be asking somebody a question. They'd give me the answer. I wouldn't even roll back with, you know, a question off their answer. I just go back to my next question. I was, uh, <laughs> I was checked literally in the deep end. I was. You know, I just thought, right. Yeah, but, but I think that, that that's what made your interview so good. The fact they weren't really, they were just natural. They were, it, was more, it was more of a chat rather than an interview. I think that's why... Mm-hmm. They were naturally bad. No, I think no, no. I think you've been <laughs> way too harsh on yourself saying that. No. I, mean, I remember your interview with um, was it Reese Evans? Was it Reece, uh, Craig's brother? Chucky, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and he was he had his sunglasses on and oh, he was giving her the old sort of Floyd Mayweather type of chat. I think that was about uh, I don't know third or fourth. In, interview I'd ever done, <laughs> and uh, we turned up. I met them at Planet Fitness, and I and I, I've That's known Chucky. I've known Chucky for, for uh, as long as I remember. You know, since he was like you know eight, nine, ten, boxing as a kid. He, he actually uh, boxed on the undercard of my last fight. But um, yeah, so I'm, I'm good friends. I'm good friends with the whole family, and um, met them up in Planet Fitness. At the time, he was still signed with um, Frank Warren. And uh, he turned up with all this kit, and he had um, glasses, flashy t-shirts, pink t-shirts, and all that. And uh, he said, uh, "I, w- I want to make a statement now." He said, "So um, let me get all wrapped up." She gets all his hands wrapped up. He got his pink t-shirt on. Not sure if he got a hat on or something. He got sunglasses on, and uh, he goes right there. So introduce him, and he goes, Wait, "Let me just, let me just start." <laughs> Let me just start this interview the way he's supposed to go. Let me tell you who I am. I'm Reese Evans Jr. I'm cool. I'm flat. I'm flash. I'm 2 0. He was only 2 0. I'm 2 0 as a pro. <laughs> uh, you know, it was just banter, you know. Yeah. I loved it. He was just joking. It was just fun. Somebody just said, oh, flip it on. He thinks he's something special. He was just having a laugh. Yeah. But, uh, so, so you know, I've done this interview, a really bad interview off my phone with him. And then uh, f- for the fourth or then, he wanted me to put on it one of his Frank Warren t-shirts, right? Size small. This <laughs> 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 me for the photo. So there is a photo playing about with me and him in, in, in the hoodie and that. Uh, and I think I, I'm right to say that that interview is still on your YouTube channel because I, I watched it maybe, I don't know, two, three weeks ago. Yeah, oh God. And I honestly it, can't, I can't watch any of the, the, especially the early stuff, I can't watch it back. Well, 
if anyone wants to laugh, we already mentioned him on, on this episode, Tony Dixon. If you want to laugh, watch, watch John's interview with Tony Dixon and Chris Jenkins when John quizzes them. Because I think you, you, you asked Chris hunting questions and you asked Tony Dixon boxing questions, if I remember rightly. That's right, yeah. So, <clears throat> another, another story about that. Turns up to a boxing club in Mount Ganache. Uh, Going to interview Tony and Chris. Uh, Chris has come down with Ronnie. Um, some sparring, like, isn't it? And uh, who would think going to a boxing gym, Tony Dixon would turn up with a gun? Not a 12 ball shot, I just say, uh, and it, one of these uh, powerful, really powerful air rifles. Uh, you know, so he's in the boxing gym showing off his gun, and uh, you know, you see, look at it, he's demonstrating, he's shooting it out the window, you know, he's up about four stories. Yeah. Shooting, shooting across it in some bloody, uh, I don't know, some old tin can or something on top of some some building about three miles away, <laughs> but they hit in the boxing club and uh, he's walking around with a gun. Uh, you, so, yeah, that, that's how that I, I was do, doing an interview with them and they were on about the, how how competitive they go far. So we decided to do a quiz, didn't we? <laughs> so um, I asked Tony what was his uh, strong points and he said. I know more about hunting than I do about boxing. Mm. Right? And Chris said, well, I know more about boxing than I do about hunting. <laughs> so, so, so I was asking Tony the um, the boxing questions. Absolutely clueless. <laughs> and Chris, the hunting, hunting uh, program, uh, questions, absolutely clueless. I think with, with Chris, with the hunt, one of the hunting questions was something, how do you get a rabbit out of the, out of the, out of his, Warren or something like that, and I think Chris said something like, "Oh, you just throw a couple of carrots down there." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I was expecting to say, you know, uh, put a dog down or put a ferret yeah. down, <laughs> <laughs> put, a, put a few carrots by the hole in it. I'll entice him out. But yeah, remember um, yeah. when I was working for SVC and one of the shows? I, can't, I think well, I know when Tony Dixon beat um, Kieran Geffen. But we all had the headsets on, so all the crew were all linked up together. So maybe like maybe 10, 15 people can all hear what's happening just so they'll say, like, oh, no, cut to this, or we go live on the commentary or whatever. So everyone's linked in. When, when Tony Dixon was being interviewed by, um, I think it was Zach Davis or whoever, after the fight, he was just, he was just, some, some of the stuff he was just coming out with, you could just hear everyone laughing on, on the headset. The whole crew were just laughing with some, with some of the things that Tony was coming out with. He's oh, a funny guy without trying to be funny. Totally yeah. If uh, if he put as much effort into, or if he loved boxing as much as he loves hunting, I tell you what, I know he's got anyway, but uh, he'd be world class. But uh, I, I went up to his house once. Um, I can't remember what I thought. I don't know. I was going to do an interview maybe or something going to start doing do, do a documentary or something, but I actually went out and did with him, so we went lamping and stuff. But before that, we went up to uh, his room and I walked in there and it was uh, all army nets, you know, like the camouflage nets, <laughs> all, all over the ceiling. <clears throat> there was about six or seven guns, you know, bolted to the wall, you couldn't remove them. Uh, and then stuff everywhere. It was like walking into a, an army navy store. He's like, he just, that's why they call him the mountain man, isn't it? Yeah. He is a character, fairly. Yeah, great character. Brilliant. I think like, boxing, because you've got so much access to the fighters, it's my phone going again in the corner. If, my house phone has never been as busy as this. Typical someone who's trying to go into. Um, yeah, but in boxing, it's great. You've got so many access to all these you know, brilliant characters like Tony Dixon and Chris Jenkins, you mentioned. Yeah, we, we're lucky, you mean. You know, um, you know, basically, if we wanted to do an interview with, with any of these boys, we'd message them. Um, if we're friends with them on Facebook or whatever, or we ring them or get in touch with their coach, and you can just organise it. It's so simple. Yeah. You know, you imagine if, if they was football players or whatever. Yeah. You just you just can't get near them. It's weird. You know, I, I went to the um, a snooker a couple of months ago down in Cardiff, and uh, you know even the snooker players, uh, Jimmy Jimmy White walked in. Um, you know he was so private and mm. kind of. More professional, I'd say. Yeah, you, you couldn't get near him, uh, you know. And the boxers after, uh, not the boxers, the, the players after the game, you know, you could just about get get up to him with a photo. 
it was so private. Whereas after after a, a show with the boxers, you know, they just box. They come out. They ringside. They talk into everybody. They have photos with everyone. They sat in the audience. It's just a total different sport than boxing. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't. It's, but I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's probably just because it boxes like right from amateurs right through the pros. It is slightly chaotic. And it's very much sort of almost on the hoof, just to the, the way things are organised. Mm. Oh yeah, it's, it's organised and uh, unlike anything else, isn't it? I remember, um, I think I probably told this before, me and my mate went to watch one of Cleverly's fights in London. Yeah. I had to film like the press conference stuff after the fight. But um, why? That's right, my mate's car broke down. That's right, I, I was meant to be staying the night, but my mate was going to come back. So I was going to stay the night in London, and my mate was planning to come home. In fact, his car broke down on the way up. So I said, look, if you want, you can just basically sleep on the floor in my room, my hotel room. So yeah, okay, we got my hotel room. The hotel, the floor space was maybe like half a metre by half a metre. It was just a bed, a cupboard, a sink, and the toilet, and that was it. So there was basically nowhere for him to sleep. Yeah. So um, I can't remember who was when the Nathan Cleverley's team told us that they had a spare room in their hotel, we, we could have, but we had to get the key off him. So after the fight, we went back to Nathan Cleverley's hotel just to get the key. And then Nathan and his dad and Darren Wilson were all there on a drink after the fight. So they, they basically invited us to you know, sit with them. We, we spent two or three hours with you know, Nathan and his team after the fight, which you know, was brilliant. But you, you, like you said, you can never imagine doing that with other... No professional Any sport. other professional sport, you just couldn't imagine it, could you? No. I got, I got a similar story, well, funny enough. Um, me and the missus travel up to uh, London to watch uh, Tony Pace. Uh, I can't remember who he was boxing at the time. But anyway, um, we booked uh, we booked the, the Ben breakfast on the way up. And then um, <clears throat> just before the fight, we was meeting uh, Tony's father, Darren, and he was going to take us back to his hotel uh, just to have a chat right before before they actually went off to the venue. So he turns up at, the, at his hotel and um, there's Tony, Darren and, and Di Gardner. Um, so we have a little chat and all that and they said, uh, you've booked an hotel, have you? I said, yeah. He said, but why didn't you stay here for the night? I said, <laughs> where to? And uh, that Darren said, well, Tony can jump in with me. <laughs> you can j- jump in with, with Rachel, like in, in the bed next to <laughs> two single beds, <laughs> you know, Mrs. Top and Dave. And, uh, you know, that, but that's the generosity. Yeah. But we said, no, no, it's fine anyway. And uh, so <clears throat> went to the venue, uh, watched the boxing. Uh, and then after the fight, then Di Gardner discovered that he forgot to take his medication with him. So they had to drive back home that night. Oh. So um, uh, Di had a double room with two double beds. So he said, um, just give me the keys for his room, you know? So yeah, oh, days. Been in the hotel and um, Chris Eubanks was there. Chris Eubanks was in there. I think it was a, Hen- it was a Hennessy show, I think, remember. I remember I think- yeah, it was a Hennessy show. Hennessy show. Um, yeah. Frankie Borg, who had a devastating knockout against Chris Eubanks. That's right, yes, I remember watching that show now. No, you mentioned yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if there's any footage of that live. Mm. Uh, um, not, not. I think it was the broadcasted live, but um, yeah, Channel Five. Any, yeah, that's right. But I don't know if there's any archive footage or anything. Yeah. But, um, up, until, up until the knockout, Frankie Ball was doing really well against Chris Eubank. I think Frankie took a fight on someone like two weeks' notice as well. He didn't have much time to to get ready for it. Yeah. No, I don't, yeah, it was a short notice fight, but. Um, yeah, I remember in, interviewing Frank, yeah, not long after that. And, you know, that's when I started to get into it. And um, he said, I didn't see you coming, man. Just an uppercut. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, He's mad. I like Frank. Yeah, nice guy, Frankie. Another, another quick story before we actually go on to our original topic, which we, we well, Welsh fights we've enjoyed watching over the years. But um, similar story to, to what we were talking about with the generosity of people in Welsh box. I made the mind from over the Ronda, real nice guy, but really quiet, he doesn't really say very much, so he keeps himself to himself type thing. But he went to watch, I think it was Liam Williams against Smith, Liam Smith, I can't remember, I can't remember it was the original fight or the rematch, I can't remember which one it was. But um, he went up there by himself, I was meant to go, but I couldn't go, I couldn't get time off work or whatever. 
So he basically up there, up there by himself. He knows Liam because he's from the Ronda. But yeah. um, when, once Liam and Guy Lockett realised that he was by himself, they basically said, look, just, just stay with us now. So for the, the whole, after the weigh-in, basically my mate, who's really quiet, but he absolutely loves boxing. So he'd yeah. happily go to a box by himself if, if he had to. Basically, he spent the whole, the rest of the day with Guy Lockett and Liam Williams and the rest of the team. Which, you know, right. for him, like, so as a boxing fan, I mean, that's, that's like sort of being a Liverpool football fan and Liverpool telling you before the FA Cup to, you know, spend the day with the Liverpool football team. You yeah. know, Gary and, you know, Gary and Liam and the rest of the boys sort of took him under, under, the, under their wings, so to speak, you know, which yeah. you don't get really in any other sport, I don't think. Yeah, it's just, it is. Especially in Wales, um, we all kind of know each other, don't we? And the, yeah. it, 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 Fox, it's, it's like a small community, isn't it? But once you sort of in in the sort of circle, is you, everyone tends to know each other, especially now you more so now with social media. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the, it is, it, we have got a good boxing family in Wales, I think. Yeah. Um. Right. When I when I originally contacted you, I've been hounding you for the last couple of weeks through a fight to talk Wales. We decided we'd chat about great fights we've watched over the years, um, you know, in person, whether whether as a fan or you know, taking pictures or reporting on it or whatever. Um, so I, I, the first fight I'm going to put out there, I think you were at it as well, you mentioned, um, and we've already mentioned his name today, Tony Pace against Lance Sheehan. What a brilliant fight that was. I think it was back in 2012, maybe, or 2011, something around that sort of time. It was about, what was it, six, seven years ago, wasn't it? Was it, was it? I thought it was a bit further longer than that. Well, anyway, whatever it was, brilliant fight. Um, from what I can remember, it's a shame that nobody's really, nobody filmed that fight properly. I know uh, Mansell Edwards, Reese Edwards' his father, he filmed the first five rounds on his phone, and then somebody yeah. else filmed the last five rounds on, on another phone. I mean, the footage yeah. is not brilliant quality, so you can't really watch it properly, really, without feeling seasick. But the fight itself, oh, one amazing fight now, round five, um, where it, it seemed that Tony Pace was w- w- within a punch or two of being stopped. But somehow he managed to get through the, the, the tough early two minutes of the, the round five. And at, by the end of the round, he was, at lunch, he had almost punched himself out to a certain extent. And Tony was, he, he'd come back at Lance and he'd almost stopped Lance in that round. Um, what, what can you remember from that night, John? Oh, it was, an, it was an amazing night, wasn't it? Um, <clears throat> I was off, I was uh, good good friends with Tony. Um, he used to come down to our gym uh, regular as an amateur and spar with one of our boys. So um, knew Tony very well before he turned professional. And then um, when he started, uh, well, obviously when he turned professional, I started getting behind him and. Um, trying to push him and try, try and promote him a little bit and uh, selling tickets and stuff. So we took down a good crowd. And like we, we had a minibus full, like, you know, 20 odd of us. And uh, it, was, it was a good packed out arena. And uh, the atmosphere that I made for that fight was absolutely brilliant. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I took down a lot of boys who hadn't been to a boxing show before. And a lot of boys who was in the boxing in the gym. They hadn't been to many shows, but I, I took them to that. And they, you know, they absolutely loved it. And you know what a night it was, wasn't it? Yeah. As you say, round, round five, Tony was out, almost out of there, um, out on his feet, wasn't he? He was like absolutely gone. And then round six, round six, he come back into the round. You know, I, I was thinking, you know, Lance will stop him now this round. Yeah. But he literally come out, like he flipped the button, and he just like absolutely one hundred percent fresh again. Mm. And then just turned the fight around, didn't he? It was unbelievable. Yeah. I don't, know, I don't, just don't know where that came from. Yeah, brilliant fight. I mean, Tony Pace was matched really tough for the start of his career. So he, he fought really good guys. Yeah. Um, obviously, when um, one of his early fights, they put him in with um, Steve Robinson's boy, didn't they? Yeah, Luke. Is it Luke Robinson? Luke. And uh, at the time, I'm not sure. I think Luke might have been signed with Frank Warren. Obviously, um, uh, Luke got his, his father, Steve Robinson, and everyone knows, isn't it? And um, 
I think they were thinking that Tony was going to be a little bit of a stepping stone for the build-up of Luke's uh, career. Yeah. But it was the other way around, wasn't it? Yeah. I seem to remember that. I think, I think that Luke Robinson against Tony Pace, that fight was one of the first... Um, one of the first fights shown on Box Nation, I seem to remember. I think yeah. it, was in, it was in Newport, the fight took place, if I can remember rightly. That's right, yeah. There is some, there is some footage on there. I think Mansell's on that one as well. Uh, <laughs> Mansell always pops up. Yeah, if you can uh, see him, you can certainly hear him normally. Because when, when Box Nation started, they had you know, very, very good intentions of taking over and you know, they was putting on loads of shows. Small little, small little shows and everything, and um, yeah, yeah on, on the foot there, I remember. I think um, on the show they had uh, Liam Williams. Uh, I think Lewis Reese was on it, possibly Selby. You know, so you know, it was a. Uh, if it carried on going the way they started, it, it would have been brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. You, you um, another brilliant fight, small hall classic. Um, I think uh, we were both at um. Chris Ware against uh, Frankie Borg. Yeah. Another br- brilliant fight, brutal fight to watch. I think you were taking pictures actually that night for what I can remember. The f- no, actually, the the first fight I was actually recording, I filmed that one. Oh, of course, yeah. They, they, they originally boxed in Bristol, didn't they? Four yeah, the first one, yeah. So that's, that's on my YouTube channel, that is. Um, yeah, that, w- that was a cracking fight, the first one. Um, in front Short of- I think Chris I think Chris Well had like twelve hours notice. I think they phoned him that day for that fight. Yeah. Um I previously, like a week or two before, watched watched them two sparring down in um I might be a bit, bit earlier than that. But anyway, I watched some sparring down in St. Joe's. And um I gotta be honest, in sparring, Frankie Ball comfortably, more than comfortably, handled Chris Ware, isn't it? Yeah. So I thought come fight night, I don't think you know. I thought he'd get, he'd get Chris out there, but um, certainly didn't. Yeah, a brilliant fight. Yeah, yeah that I think was one of those fights where at, at times they were they were hitting each because neither, neither boxer Chris or Frankie didn't seem to pay any attention to defend themselves. It was just one hundred percent about hitting the other guy as much as you could. Oh, unbelievable! Especially, especially this. You know, um, I can't even remember. The, what was the result of the first fight? Was it a draw? I think no. Uh, Chris, where Chris beat him the first fight in the four rounder. Beat him the first fight, didn't he? Yeah, because yeah, he, he, he gave him. A, he dropped him, didn't he? Yeah, I think he dropped right. him. I can't remember which round it was, but uh, oh, him. Him all right. so then yeah, that was only like a four rounder, and then they had the rematch, end, didn't they, for the for the Welsh? Yeah, because Frankie was the Welsh champion. Yeah. Uh, down in Newport, and that fight was well. I can't remember. That was up there with one of the best, wasn't it? Yeah, and I think if if people want to watch that back, I think that's, that was on Eurosport. I think it's, I presume it's still on on YouTube somewhere. It was on YouTube anyway. Yeah, uh, a really good, um, br- brilliant fight. I remember I was uh, I was sitting in the sort of the press section, if you like, the sort of press seats. I sit next to David Owen, Di Owen from who had yeah. the TTLO podcast. Yeah. Obviously, he was a. He, I think he had a website. Yeah, maybe, maybe right a few actually. John was he right for Boxing Media UK at the time? Yeah, I, think or, was, yeah. I know he had his own website in the end, but um, he obviously you know he know, knows Chris Ware very well. But when you sort of sit in the media section, he's supposed to be neutral. But soon as yeah. as soon as Chris Ware knocked him out, Di was just jumping up and down and cheering. Like and then he then he realised that he probably uh, he, he probably not not the way to be behaving and the um. He sort of slowly sort of sort of crept out of the press section over to Chris Ware's uh, fans, I think, from what I can remember. Yeah. Well, I I'd become quite close with Frankie Borg. Obviously, I think one of my very first interviews was with Frankie. Uh, and you know, I gotta be honest, he um made me feel very welcome. I made the interview easy. Yeah. And after that we do become quite close uh, on the scene like, isn't it? So I was edging towards um, Frankie Borg, you know, but trying to be as neutral as possible. I'm taking photos. I, I'm ringside, you know, I can't shout or nothing like that. And um, I remember after that fight, I interviewed um, Chris Ware. That's on there as well. One of my best interviews, actually. Mm-hmm. Not only because Chris made that. But yeah, I'm, I'm interviewing Chris Ware. And I'm, I remember he says to me, he said, I remember being over in the corner 
sat in my stool looking over to you for some like uh, inkling of like you know things are doing good or like that. And he said you should get your face was just you know, I, I didn't want to say that things because uh, you know deep down I wanted Frankie to win I suppose. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that was a, that was amazing. That was a good night. That was one of the best certainly. Yeah, and I think I think I'm right in saying also on that that card that bill of boxing was um the rematch between Camacho and uh, Craig Kennedy. Which that was another you know, cracking scrap. Yeah. Remember the first yeah. fight, Camacho bit Kennedy, didn't he? In the thing I was in Merthyr. That's right, yeah. So they had the rematch on, on well, I wouldn't say it, well, it was a, a double bill, really. You know, I think it was, I think the show was called Unfinished Business, which I suppose it was Unfinished Business. And yeah. at the time, if you remember, there was a real grudge between, a, no, a genuine grudge between Kennedy and Camacho. Oh, massively, wasn't it? You could um, feel, no, you could see that you could feel the tension between them. The there was a brilliant atmosphere. They, they was in, uh, they was in denial of even the instant happening. They've been biting him, weren't they? But uh, yeah. there was video footage and photos of him actually doing it. But uh, yeah, there was. Uh, I used to like all that bad intentions. I used to say, <laughs> oh, I like him. The boys don't like each other, so it kind of gives a bit of a, yeah. a bit of scrap. But. Um, yeah, that's another good night. There was for me. Yeah, brilliant fight. Yeah, another um, well, Welsh classic, obviously world famous fight. But uh, Joe Calzaghe beat um, Jeff Lacey. Another fight. I I went to my missus. Um, in, we were sitting in the cheap seats miles away, but absolutely amazing night. Probably one of the best performances by a Welsh boxer ever, really. I suppose. Yeah, it's mad really looking back on it. That at the time Joe was, I think amongst the American press. Certainly, he was he was the underdog going into that fight. Yeah, yeah, another fantastic night, and uh, I got another story about that one. Um, <laughs> uh, I'd been to you know I'd been to a couple of Joe's fights, and uh, they was always in uh, I think it was the CIA at the time, another motor point. So I went to a few of his fights, and then um, obviously as. Uh, he got better and better and fighting better boys. Um, he was looking for bigger arenas, and uh, I was thinking he wanted to sell out Manchester Arena like Ricky Atten. Um, so yeah, we we organised a trip. <laughs> oh God, where did we start? So yeah, we organised this trip. Um, me and two of the boys from the gym. So I saw I sort up the tickets, and then I was leaving it to one of the other boys. To sort out uh, our, our digs for the night. Yeah. So he picks me up eight o'clock in the morning, right? We drive up to Manchester. What was it? Four hour drive? Yeah, I'd say four hours. Depends on traffic. Four, a bit four, longer. Four. Probably by the time we got there, it was about one o'clock, you know, stop for fuel and food and stuff. About one o'clock. So um, I said, um, right, then let's go and check into our. Uh, Ben Black or hotel or whatever, and then we'll have a little walk around Manchester. It'll be nice to see all the scenery, have a look at do, do a bit of shopping, uh, have a look at the arena and stuff, and then um, we'll go back out later. So um, I says, Where are we staying to? And he says, I'm like, Oh, the travel lodge. And um, I goes, Okay, do you know which one? Ah, he said, ah, I, I know the one. <laughs> so we're just driving around, he sees the travel lodge. Gets out of the out of the car, got our bags and all that. Goes into the travel lodge and he says, "I got a reservation for George." And this lady looks on the thing. Uh, no, no reservation. Um, so is any other travel lodges? Uh, no, none of the travel lodge where there's a, a Premier Inn or something. Where, you know, half a mile down the road. And he went, "Oh, must have been a bloody Premier Inn." I organised. I I booked this in there. <laughs> So jumps back in the car, don't know where we're going, driving round, sees a Premier in, goes in there, gets our bags, walks in, reservation for George, looking on the desk, no no, no reservation for George. It's like, oh, he's flipping out, man. You know, I thought you'd, uh, you know, you'd booked this hotel. He's, he's like, yeah, but I can't remember what hotel I booked. <laughs> oh, I said, Have you got any... Um, Reservations, you yeah. and uh, the guy says, uh, No, I'll be fully booked. He said, You, you won't get an, an, another, another room now. We said, Because it's for, for, for the boxing, it's so great. So, jumps back in the car. Um, 
driving around, still don't know where we're going. We see another hotel, I don't know, some big chain. Ah, that's the one, that's the one. We goes in there. Reservation for George? Looks, no reservation, right? So anyway, I, we, we drove around. I don't know, for a, we went to 10 different hotels. Still hadn't seen, uh, found, found this hotel that we're supposed to be staying at, right? By the time, this, the time is going on and on and on and on and on. It's now eight o'clock in the evening, right? <laughs> so 12 hours after we left, we're still looking for this hotel that he supposedly booked eight hours, uh, 12 hours later. Um, traffic had built up, it was terrible. Didn't know where he was going. I, we'd probably been in about 20 hotels, still couldn't find our hotel. So in the end, I just said to him, look, we pulled into a train station car park. I uh, said, we'd have to stay in here for that. Just parked in there, went to the box in, and then ended up going back to the car park and staying in the car park for like that. <laughs> um, oh. I can't, I think that, that fight was around February, March time. So I had tickets for actually for Christmas. So it wasn't, it was probably, I'm guessing it was probably quite cold that I thought in the car. Yeah, it was freezing and, um, you know, we, we was going to, driving up, I think I probably just had a t-shirt on and then going into the event, I think I just had a shirt. So, um, and you know, it was like in the event, it's boiling hot and all that. And coming up, running back to our car, and it was absolutely freezing. And um, I was in the passenger seat, he was in the driver's seat and then the other boy then, I don't think the back seats folded down. And uh, so he actually had more room if he got in the boot. So he actually stayed in, in, in the boot the other one. <laughs> Freezing cold. You know, he was turning the car on now and again for a bit of, a bit of heat. But um, we was worried because we'd all had a drink. That if the police come, you know, they, they do yeah. something driving. They can be strict on can they? But yeah, well, what a memorable night. So but, did, you, um, did you find out? What was it a hotel booked? We don't know. Still don't know to this day. Um, I, I, if you knew Ollie, you'd say no, it wasn't. You know? <laughs> but after that, Ollie's nickname now is Ollie Tom Tom. <laughs> he reckons he knows where he's going, but he just have not got a clue. Yeah. But yeah, back to the boxing of that night. Um, what an amazing night and what an amazing atmosphere. Yeah. Joe Kawasaki. Like, like you said, uh, Lacey was... Um, Gonna come over here, and uh, he, you know he was uh, the new Mike Tyson of dub does, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. He's gonna come over here and uh, tear Joe Kawasaki apart, but um, couldn't have been further from the truth. It was just a one-sided. But in the other way, wasn't it? Joe Kawasaki yeah. absolutely hammered him. Yeah, and, and, and every sort of department really. Um, probably get well. If you if you watch the fight back now, probably you know Lacey's corner or the team could, could have pulled him out maybe after nine ten rounds perhaps or even before that because it was clear he was going he wasn't going to win he took yeah. a real beat in and i think you know that that, that Je uh, jeff lacy was never the same after that fight his career just d bombed in after that yeah so, yeah uh, yeah like i said he was getting, he was after round eight he was literally just Target practice for Joe Kawasaki, wasn't he? And um, you know what Kawasaki likes, he probably throws 100, 200 punches around. And, um, I think you hit him with over a thousand punches that night. Yeah, yeah. Obviously. Yeah, it's strange, isn't it? Like you said, um, you see that quite a lot in boxing, you know. Some of these boys, they can be 20, 20 and 0, uh, knocked out 21 of their opponents, and then once they've had that one defeat or got knocked out themselves, they, they never seem to come back. Themselves, yeah. I think, well, pr probably to a lesser extent because obviously he didn't come back and win the world title. But like Mike Tyson, I, I think mentally, I think after he lost to Buster Douglas, he was never, he was never the same. I don't think. No, it's obviously. Um, I, I suppose he thought he was invincible, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. You know? Probably thought he was invincible, walking through everybody basically, and then um, once he was tested and pushed and taken out of his comfort zone. I suppose reality at home, and then uh, you realise, you know, you're not the only one out there. Um, another uh, fight which I feel we, we should mention, um, JR, Jay Harris's brilliant performance um, in Texas against Martinez. Um, well, a, a, a performance where I think Jay said when he, went, when he went into the ring, they were booing him. 
and when he left the ring, they were cheering him. Everyone wanted pictures of him. They're all you know, shouting his name. Um, Jay Harris he hasn't had it easy in his professional career. He's had a really tough, not really getting the fights he needed, not not getting the you know, the opportunities really. Um, still working at Amazon as well. Still holds on a, a job. Oh, and, that's uh, crazy. But I mean, what, what do you think of that fight, John? I didn't see it live, and then. Um... <clears throat> Obviously, he was flipping. Everybody was talking about it on social media, and then um, is it? I'm not sure if it's Sky Sports. They've got it on their YouTube channel. Yeah, they have. Yeah, yeah. So check out their YouTube channel if you love your boxing, because there's loads of wicked content on that moment. Um, I watched it the other day, and um, you know the fight was totally different to what I expected. But obviously, people said it was a good fight, very competitive, and then when you've seen. Uh, the, the scorecards I thought well, it couldn't have been you know mm. that competitive you know I don't think it gave them, um, didn't give him any rounds did they no. and then uh, when, when I watched the fight oh fuck I don't know what an absolute oh, it's just his work rate as well and um, combinations I, I just love the way he boxes I hope he boxed brilliant fair play yeah and yeah. obviously he proved he's world class haven't he Oh, definitely. Um, I mean, considering Frank Warren released him from his contract, I know, and Frank Warren really didn't do anything for Jay, I don't think. He didn't give him the fights he deserved. MTK and Leiden did a brilliant job in getting Jay the right fights to get him to this opportunity. And obviously Jay has kept his side of the bargain by, well, putting in brilliant performances like that. Yeah, and, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> if, you, if you've met him or you know him, you know he's a lovely, lovely boy. Yeah. And uh, he, he deserves everything he gets because uh, well, he puts it in the graft, doesn't he? Oh, yeah, definitely. Like I said, lovely guy. I mean, <laughs> this how, how unlucky is Jay Harris? As a, as a, There's not many flyweight boxers in Britain or even like Western Europe or United States. Most flyweight smaller guys tend to come from you know, Far East or you know, poorer countries. Yeah. Jay Harris happens to be in Wales, which hasn't got many flyweight boxers anyway. He just happened to be a boxer, a flyweight boxer as an amateur at the exact same time as Andrew Selby and Daniel Chapman, two other world class flyweights. Yeah. I'm not he that. got it easy at all from his amateur days right through to the pros. And well, like, like you said, he's, he's a great guy, lovely guy. If you met him, he, he's, you, you wouldn't even think he's a boxer. I think he's about, I guess, you know, he's late 20s, but he looks about, I don't know, 12, <laughs> 13. <laughs> He looks like a 16-year-old boy, doesn't he? he really yeah. Is that, uh, well, I don't know. You wouldn't want to overlook him, would you? No. But, um, yeah, so just so, so pleased for Jay. I thought we had to give him a little mention. Um, I'm re- really excited now just to see where his career goes next. Yeah, fantastic. I know you mentioned uh, Selby and Chapman eh? there. There was potential talk of him and Selby at one point, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah. I think the border control um, mandated that fight to take place. But I think, um, uh, I can't remember now, I think Selby had a bigger fight. Oh, Selby, yeah, Selby had the, the fight with Martinez, didn't he? The fight that he lost, he got stopped. So he took yeah. that fight instead, I think, is what happened. And it's strange now how, how things have worked out, that for a long time, Selby would be considered the better fighter between himself and Jay Harris. Whereas now, really, if that fight was to be made, no, I, I put Jay Harris as the favourite. Well, um, it's, it's a tough call there. I know it'd be a very, uh, you know, on, on paper, it's very close. Um, you, you know, you know the fights I love. I love uh, British domestic and, uh, you know, two Welsh boys fighting each other for what, whatever title would be uh, no, no bigger fight for me, you know. Yeah. I much prefer to see two British boys fighting each other than a British guy fighting American. But, um, yeah. If that fight could happen, that would be absolutely fantastic, and I'm sure ooh, that, that sell some tickets that fight. Oh, definitely. I think as well. Um, I think Andrew Selby has got uh, an eliminator for the European title coming up. I think. Oh, don't did have. I mean, it's probably it's obviously quite called off now. But it's going to be interesting to see. Um, he, he's back. Was that going to be on, be on the Cardiff show? Then, because he was talking about being on that Cardiff show as well. Yeah. Oh, no, Jay. Jay, you mean? No. Andrew. Andrew. Um, I I didn't think so, but I mean, it could be perhaps. I, I don't know. Hmm. But he, he he wasn't at the press conference, and they didn't mention his name at the press conference. So no. 
Um, and he's with with MTK, isn't he? He's not with Matchroom, so. Right. So I'm not hundred percent sure, to be honest. That was looking to be a good show as well, wasn't it? Yeah, got it. I was really looking forward to that. Really looking forward to it. All, all the fights really well matched. Um, a lot of the the sort of the, the Welsh boys we've been following, like Gavin Gwynn, Nathan Thorley, um, basically getting step ups in class to a certain extent. So tough yeah. fights, but fights. So you, you know, you, they'd have to win really if they want to move forward in boxing. So really good matchups. Yeah. Um, it's good that they've recognised now that, you know, I know they struggle to put on shows because they want to sell tickets, but um, if they come to Wales now with the likes of Selby, um, Joe Cordina, he sells loads of tickets, yeah. doesn't he? Uh, Gavin Gwynn, he sells loads of tickets. I think uh, Thorley does well with tickets. You, you put a good show on in Wales now with the, with the boys we got out there. Yeah. I, th- I think it makes a big difference as well having the show in the motor point because in the centre of Cardiff people can go for a few pints and make, make a night of it whereas if it's in some of the other venues even like a couple of miles outside Cardiff it's just awkward to get to yeah like when when, when the last two shows was in the, the ice arena don't get me wrong it's a cracking venue but then once you come out you, you're in the middle of nowhere aren't you yeah it's not even in walking distance or anything but uh, yeah motor point uh, yeah, you get that sold out the more the point you get a you know, get a good atmosphere in there. Yeah. We're talking about great fights, which we well when we should have mentioned from um I think you were there, uh, Gavin Reese and Gary Buckland. The uh, motor point. Yeah. That's actually the last well, one of the last shows they match room put on and motor, motor point actually. I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, obviously they had uh, one and two there, didn't they? Yeah. The the original fight. Oh br- brilliant fight. Brutal fight. Yeah. I remember Probably, we was just, we was talking about um, some of the best box uh, fights we've seen in Welsh boxing, and obviously that's another one that's up there with life for me. Yeah, definitely. And I, I remember I think Gavin Gavin Reese and Gary Buckland are both quite well, very white. Obviously they're white guys, but they are very particularly white, and you can just see their body just changing colour throughout the fight from all the body punches. Yeah, like just uh, red blotches and marks on their bodies. If you look at some of the photos or the video footage, yeah, like you, like you see, looks like they had like uh, third degree burns around their stomach. Right. That's how red it was. Um, it was relentless on the body shots. Out of the two of them were stood where they was taken. I don't know. Yeah, me. Brilliant fight. But uh, yeah, it's good to see afterwards. I think they went back to Gavin's uh, pub, didn't they? And had a drink. <laughs> it's just absolutely yeah. fantastic. Um, talking about great Welsh fights, obviously you... you you run amateur boxing gym, so I guess I guess you're lucky enough to see lots of good amateur fights. Any of your boys you want to mention from the gym and good good scraps? Well, to be honest, um, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, probably uh, two months ago, um, <clears throat> we get a call from a club up in uh, Birmingham. Would we uh, want to f- take a fight for our boy Mark Davis? Um, he's had like 39 fights. Uh, majority of his fights were as a kid. He's probably had about like, about ten up to about ten senior fights now, and he's uh, he was a fifty fifty boy, so won as many as he'd lost. Uh, would we fight Mark Davis against their boy? Um, can can you remember his name? No apologies for that if he does watch the show. Um, and he was the same. I think he was twenty two fights, eleven and eleven. So I said, yeah, we'll. We'll take the fight. I asked Mark, like, you don't need no notice. I think they rang me on the Friday. Rang Mark, yeah, we've got some travels up to uh, to Birmingham to, to fight this boy. And the first thing I go is, when we, when we goes in, I says to the lady, you know, can I have a look at his card to see if he has done what he'd done and see if, you know, any, uh, if he'd knocked out his last 10 opponents or whatever. And then just to give you a bit of an idea what he was. And they said, um, Oh, he's just come to us from another another gym and they wouldn't give him his card, so he's only got a brand new card. So I thought, well, at the end of the day, Mark is he's open class. Um he's been in there with the best in Wales, uh, or some of the best in Wales, and um you know, put up more more than a competitive fight. So I thought we'll give it a go, aren't they? Yeah. So um <clears throat> they kept us to last and uh, I was thinking that was a bit funny. It was, it was a daytime show, a fantastic arena. 
can't, 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 can't remember the name of the venue, but big, big, huge club, uh, big DJ stand, and a big, huge dance hall, and they like teared up to, to steps in the background. Great club, great venue. Um, I goes down, coming up about a fight or two before, just to see um, you know when we're on next. And when we're downstairs, um, I see this boy on the pads, and I'm one of these ones that never take pads for granted because you know I've been to hundreds of amateur shows and I see a lot of kids on pads with their, their coaches and they look absolutely like the next Mayweather, yeah. and then they go into the ring and like. Well, where's all that going, you know? Yeah. So I never take what they look like for pads for granted. But I've seen this boy, boy on the pads. And I was thinking, flipping now, this boy, oof, he's something special. <laughs> so he was downstairs on the pads with his coach. And we was upstairs. You could hear everything. So I walked back upstairs and um, Mark went, I can hear that boy on the pads. He went, why are you putting me in with John? <laughs> I'm like, oh, don't worry about it. I said, and I've just been down there and seen him on the pads. I said, he's looking rubbish. <laughs> I said, rubbish. I said, he's looking, pardon, his corner man's doing all the work, like, isn't it? So, <laughs> we goes down, down into the ring, into the ring. Into the ring. Um, Mark, Mark sees him for the first time. He's like, fucking hell, he's taller than me. And Mark's like, yeah. Uh, Six foot, six, six foot. Yeah. He says, big boy, and he says, oh, I don't mind now, you'll be all right. So um, we call him, introduce that boy first, and he walks into, into, the, into the, the centre of the ring. They call him the, the ginger warrior or something. And he's <laughs> bashing his chest, he is, looking at Mark. And um, I thought, that's right. I said, don't worry about it. He said, he's a tall boy. It's, he's just going to be nice boxing at range. This will suit your style. This will be a nice... Nice fight now. So, um, round one goes out. Um, I don't even think this boy threw one single jab, honestly. It was all lead hooks, backhands, hooks underneath. But it was just like, uh, all his work was five or six punch combinations from hooks and, you know, straight hard yeah. punches. And then just grabbing all the mark. And then like, so Mark couldn't really get his work off. And then as soon as he'd have his breathing, he'd be back out again. It was one of the most fierce, aggressive fights I'd ever seen. And um, I'm like, goes back to the corner, wrong one. Mark went, why are you put me in with? He's a beast. I went, don't worry. <laughs> We've seen the best of him. Listen, he will not keep that pace up. Trust me. Right? We've seen the best of him. He's going to slow down. Anyway, we, we, he, go, he goes back out there. His three rounds, he had absolute non-stop. One hell of a pace, one hell of a fight, you know. Um, Mark's giving him as good as he's given Mark, but um, fair play. Um, one of the best fights, I'm not just saying this because he's one of my boys, but it's one of the best fights and the atmosphere and uh, everything, you know, the adrenaline I'd, I'd ever watched. Um, at the end of the fight, um, Mark didn't get the win, but uh, the, the ring announcer, you know, he got on, got on and said, Come on, let's give him a round of applause. At the, the place went wild, uh, and he was like, bloody hell, he don't half make these boys tough down in Wales, do they? And, um, you know, we, 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 we left the show, and Mark was like, like a celebrity. People was shaking his hand and telling him well done and stuff like that. Yeah. And um, oh, it was just an amazing fight. Fair yeah. play. Yeah, so, um, yeah. so, I, so I suppose, I mean, Obviously, Mark didn't get the decision you, you just mentioned there, uh, but I suppose it, 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 it probably built his confidence, I'm guessing. He probably took a lot from that fight. Yeah, you know, confidence-wise, you know, um, he was a bit gutted, but I was literally so chuffed, and, and I, I was buzzing, and I, and I feel it a bit now talking about the fight. Um, you know, lots of people won the win, yeah, kind of, we all won the win, but that's all I really want, 100%, is my boy to give 100% performance. Yeah. And uh, that, that night, the performance he gave, you know, if he did get a win, I don't think it would have done it made any difference to how I was feeling. I was so proud of him. Mm. It was just a fantastic fight. And uh, I said, you know, these, these are the fights you need to be involved with now and again to really take you to that next level. Yeah. And um, 
yeah, I, I got to be honest. After after that fight, he came back to the to the gym, and um, he was like a new man, like yeah. a new man. Is is there um, any footage of that fight online? Is is it on YouTube or anything? Or did did Mark get a copy of it? I've actually got some footage, yeah. I have got some footage because um, Luke Richards, the other one of the other boys, he came up with us and he filmed some of it. But yeah. he's off a phone from a distance, like. But um, yeah, it, it was great. Think one of the then, like, go on. No, I was going to say one of the best amateur fights I've probably ever watched was um, Daniel Chapman. I think you obviously know Daniel. A lot of people know Daniel. Does bare boxing now? But um, yeah, when he won the. When was it? 2011, 2011 or 2010 senior finals. Um, him and Sean McGoldrick had to have a box off for who represented Wales or who, who yeah. Wales would put forward to the World Championships, I think it was. Which in effect also also was um, like an Olympic qualifier. When uh, Daniel Chapman boxed Sean McGoldrick for, a, I think it was a, a box off basically to who would represent Wales in the World Championships, I think it was. I can't 100% remember. But, um, you know, Sean McGoldrick was a massive favourite in that fight. Daniel was a big underdog. And the atmosphere, like Daniel sells all the tickets anyway. I mean, he probably bought maybe 50, 60 people down. To yeah. Tell me, there's a bit of a story behind that. I heard something like that. Um, they wanted that um, box off to happen behind closed doors or something. Didn't they? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they did, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think... I'm not sure why exactly, but they did... So Sean McGoldrick was Welsh ABAs. That's what they wanted to win, basically. That's what they... And because... Um, I think because Daniel won the senior finals. I don't think Sean entered the senior finals because he was part of the GB setup, whereas Daniel wasn't. Daniel had been released by GB at that point, I think. Right. So they, they, they didn't really want Daniel to go for whatever reason. I can't quite remember the exact story behind it. But um, yeah, Daniel, what a, yeah, well, what a brilliant, just brilliant performance. I mean, Sean McGoldrick, so well, world class amateur boxer. Yeah, yeah. And then the atmosphere, well, just, just well, probably, probably the best amateur fight I've watched that, that I can remember, anyway. I can imagine because uh, obviously both boys are obviously very, very high level. Um, I, I didn't, I didn't see too, so much of uh, McGoldrick in the amateurs, but. Um, you know, I've seen Chapman, he got fast hands, so I can imagine the, the pace of that fight, you know? Yeah. yeah. I think I actually, I, I, I took a picture, I, I think I was taking pictures on it, actually, and I think Boxing News one of my, used one of my pictures. Yeah. With the uh, landing shot. Put it up, I'd like to see that. Yeah. I think what, I, what's, I, what's happening with Dan Chapman these days, anyway? Um, he's got his own gym now, in my, my stake. Yeah, I've seen him on Instagram, it looks uh, like he's 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 Still doing the bare knuckle boxing. So, could, would he um, consider going off to the pros, or I don't know? We spoke uh, about that. Yeah, I've mentioned a few times. I think he's he's happy in the bare knuckle boxing. I think the the, the way they organise the bare knuckle boxing is um, you know really well organised. It's a bit of showbiz televised. You know, they got good people working for them, like the interviews and media work, that type of thing. Yeah. Um. So I think he's just happy doing that. I mean, I'd, I'd love him to just give have a run to the pros. But I mean, he's yeah. I think he's about twenty seven, twenty eight now, so he wouldn't have too many years you no know, left, I guess. He'd have to be sort of now, really. He'd have to give it a go if he, if he was going to give it a go. No, but I, I imagine though, if he, he he turned over, go down to the correct weight, whatever weight that may be, yeah. um, the level he, the level he's at, you know. He, he could have probably a, a warm up fight and then fight for the British straight away, couldn't he? And yeah, maybe you know. he'd have to lose hell of a lot of weight, man, because he got huge arms and shoulders now. Yeah, and, and I imagine he would have, he would be a you know promoter's dream because from what I've seen on interviews with him, with you, he's a you know he's a very good talker. Mm. Um, like a, you know his gym is having been open how long is absolutely thriving. That's obviously you know he knows how to. Sell, sell things and I imagine he could sell himself and um, I, I think he'd be a big thing to come out of Wales if he was in Marsh Boxing Yeah I, th- I think so yeah but he just I mean I think everyone he's probably sick of people asking, asking about that because he, he does get asked it quite a lot but he just I think he's just he's happy doing what he's doing I, I think yeah. the, level I, he's bo- the, the level he's boxing at in the bare knuckle he's, I think it's a waste 
he's yeah, he, he, yeah. I agree to a certain extent. And another thing that's a waste. Um, I don't really know. This is one of the biggest wastes in Welsh boxing. Uh, yeah. You don't know about this, but I had a, a clean out in this room the other day. As you know, this is my little office under the stairs. Now it's smaller than the bloody prison cell. I, I live in here, but um, I had a clean out the other day and I come across this and I thought, well, what an absolute waste. <laughs> yes, the fight game. I'll have to, yeah. So here is the fight game. Keelan Gibbons' documentary on Alid Cook. I've had the privilege of watching this, and it is an absolute... This is your best work for me. Well, I think it's your, it's your best work, and it's not even up there. No. You need to get that online. Yeah. You don't need to do that. Yeah, I should. Well, there we go. I'm gonna put. I'll try and get that online by the end of this week. Oh, you got it! That is absolutely fantastic. The, the, the only reason I am for it online is just well, no, it's, just, it's a poor excuse. Is that I have to? I'd have to probably sit and spend two three hours just doing all the credits. So I'm yeah. I'm, done, I'm done the credits for it because it because um well I just am done the credits. Um, just talk about amateur boxing there. Eh? I know you, you've you've had a few shows and um. Every year I say I go to my amateur shows. I, I, the last sort of six months, I've probably been to more amateur boxing shows than I have been years. It's just the only reason I go, just lack of time. But I would say, on average, an amateur boxing show is more entertaining than your average pro show. Because yeah, every, every fight in an amateur show, the box, the both boxers want to win. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And um, like, you, like you said, <laughs> both the boxers, they both want to win, so they give it 100%. Um, most of the fights um, pretty fairly matched so you get good competitive fights so yeah you know you, you always get a cracking night whether it's uh, you know the kids having their first skill skills about eight nine ten or you know even some of the exhibitions they can get a bit rowdy and um, yeah right right the way through you'll get a good competitive fight yeah. and uh, yeah I absolutely love uh, my amateur boxing family, and um, yeah, I can't wait, to, can't wait to see them also. Okay, and uh, okay, I think we'll we leave it at that point there, John. We've been waffling on for I don't know, probably over an hour now, I guess. Is it really? I think so, yeah. I'm not quite, I can't see a clock on here, but I think it's been roughly an hour. Can't be far short of an hour. Can't be far off. Um, so, uh, for whoever decides to watch this, hope you enjoyed it and got something from it. Um, put, pass a little bit of your time. Everyone's got plenty of time in their hands now. And uh, well, stay tuned. And if I can try and pin John down, we'll do another fighting talk Wales lockdown. And, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe if we do the next one, maybe um, we pick a couple of boxes and we'll just talk about them or something, is it? Yeah, and I, mean, I think I think we're using this on Zoom. There, there is a way of bringing in um, extra people on this, so we could have like two or three people, maybe bring in a few guests. Yeah. We can organize ourselves enough. Okay, John, it's been good to talk to you about. Um, yeah. you I'll, try you talk you, uh, sorry, I'll try and get the fight game online by the end of this week. Look forward to seeing that, definitely. You know. I, I know I've got to be like, I watch it any time, but uh, uh, it'd be great to get that out online. It really would. Uh, there I'm it. Okay, brilliant. Cheers, John. And uh, if, if you enjoyed this, uh, give it a, a share on on Facebook. I'm not quite sure where we're even going to put this. We could put it on YouTube or Facebook or whatever, but uh, just give it a share or a like or, I don't know, just do whatever. Hopefully you can Cheers, watch guys. it past more than three minutes. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Take care, everybody. Stay safe.